Good afternoon, and welcome to our session, Playful Learning with Story Workshop. My name is Liz McCaw. I am a Reggio-inspired nature kindergarten teacher. I also work as a consultant, bringing a little bit of Reggio and outdoor learning to teachers, schools, school districts, and learning centers. I'm also the author of a teacher book, Outside Our Window, Developing a Primary Nature Program. And I'm really excited to share this framework with you today. Our agenda is very simple. What is Story Workshop? I thought that it would be really good for us to have a common definition. Reflecting upon your environment, gathering resources, changes to your schedule. What's your role as a teacher while the children are doing Story Workshop and assessment tools? All of the photos with children in them are from the internet, mostly from the Opal School. And the reason is I don't have permission to share my students' photos online. However, I think it's very important to include children in some of the workshop as I find it inspirational. So what is Story Workshop? According to the Opal School, it's a classroom framework they initially developed to support language and literacy. Over time, the teacher researchers found that the use of rich materials, such as clay, paint, loose parts, or blocks, played an integral role in language development and strongly supported children to see themselves as storytellers and authors. This is a structure that I use for Story Workshop. I set up loose parts around the classroom as a creative and open-ended invitation. If I'm doing an inquiry, I may set up provocations, provide an opportunity for children to work with a peer, circulate and support the children, recording observations as needed, and then end the session when the children's stamina is reached. Ensure that the children have continuous access to story play materials to offer opportunities for story play throughout the morning. Be intentional in your role as observer, recorder, supporter, and assessor. As much as possible, allow the children to co-construct their stories. As a Reggio-inspired educator, I want to offer learning environments that communicate what I believe about children. Kind, capable, competent, and curious. So when you're thinking about your classroom, I want you to think about the space in your classroom. How is your furniture arranged? How much furniture have you actually brought into the classroom? Have you created intimate spaces for children to work with a partner? Are your tables large so that they can spread out their materials? Do you have a wide open space for gathering, for meeting, for congress? Can that large space be used for story workshop? How are the pathways in your room? When children enter the room, does the design of your furniture lead them to um, these workspaces? What kind of light is in your room? I like to use a soft light. My windows uh, blinds are up so that natural light is coming in. And in the dark corners, I've supplemented with lamps and I've added twinkle lights all over the room to add a bit of magic. What kind of materials are you bringing into the room? As a Reggio teacher, an organized, um, clean room is really important to me. And so I only have materials in my space that the children have continuous access to. If we're not using that learning center or those materials, then they're removed and put away inside a closed cupboard or taken home. I want my students to have easy access to materials, especially for story workshop. So you can arrange your story workshop materials in different ways. I'm going to talk about that later in the session. But when thinking about the design of your room, where will you place your story workshop materials so that they can access them and transport them, use them, and then return them? We want it to be as easy and simple as possible so that they are successful right from the get-go. 
thinking about the time that the children have to co-create co their stories. They're going to gather their materials or set up the materials, add to the materials. They need time to talk about their ideas, to start to place the materials around the table or on the floor. They need to negotiate, listen, compromise, inspire, lead each other as they create these stories. All of this takes time. They need to learn to trust you, that you're going to give them the time they need to create these stories. If you're rushing them, they'll never dig deeply and create complex stories, which is your goal. They won't have time to sketch their ideas, draw a story, or write a story. So when you're planning your story workshop, choose a time of day where you know you can expand that block until their needs are completely met and supported. We use a lot of authentic materials in our program. And what I do is I am very intentional in how they're going to use them. The purpose isn't to for the children to make specific things when they're using the clay for story workshop. The purpose is to teach them a cognitive sequence that they can apply when they encounter anything new. It's how to observe, how to question, explore, reflect, and repeat. So they'll use those materials to support their story development. Here's a photo from the Opal School, and I want you to notice that they put two large tables together, and each child has a placemat to identify their workspace. They're close enough that they can engage each other in conversation and co-create their stories. This is a photo from my room. So this student was creating a story using a mix of purchased loose parts and nature loose parts. And she was organizing them just as she began her story. Um, a short while later, another student joined her and had to find out what was taking place in the story. And then together they could make changes and co-create the story. Here's another photo from my classroom, and I just want you to notice the silk. So in pre-COVID days, I like to add a lot of sensory materials to my story workshop. And so adding a piece of silk, an old silk scarf, or a purchased piece of silk is a wonderful way to add that um, smooth texture to their stories. In this picture from my classroom, I want you to notice that it was a very large space for this child, but I wanted to anchor the workspace, so I provided a mat, um, which is the blue felt. This child's using a mix of purchase materials, little um, whales from a tube uh, ocean theme, um, some trees that I made and the children painted with watercolors, some um, fabric from the recycling box, some nature, some driftwood, and loose parts from around the classroom. This photo is from the Opal School, and I love how they've set the table with a tablecloth and then a, a placemat to identify the child's workspace and lots of open-ended loose parts for them to use to tell a story. I like that they're close enough that they're able to talk and share ideas, but there's enough space that the materials aren't getting mixed up. Here's another photo from the Opal School, and I want you to notice that they've started to record their story. They're working together to create it, moving the loose parts around to fit their story idea, and he's got his pencil and paper there just to record their ideas and perhaps um, make a plan for how to write their story. This is probably the pre-kinder class, and what I want you to notice is that they have made some of their characters using stiff paper. They've painted some of the pig people, and they've brought in some loose parts and recycled um, pieces. So they've got some foil from the recycling bin and an old piece of carpet. And sometimes in Story Workshop, it's left, there's a dedicated space for Story Workshop in the classroom, and the children are able to revisit that space and add on to their stories throughout the day or even the week. 
This is a photo from my classroom and we were doing a forest inquiry who lives in our forest and so during story workshop I set up provocations around the classroom that day um, with forest themed materials to encourage them to create stories about who lives in our forest. During our family inquiry I set up provocations around the classroom to encourage the children to create stories about family. Lots of the children were interested in um, pets and animals that lived in their yards. And so I put out some loose parts. You can see there's some buttons and an old doorknob, some materials from our dollhouse and some animals that had been part of their conversations to inspire them to create stories about around family. This was an inquiry we were doing about animals um, adapting. So we were looking at migration, we were looking at animals that hibernate, animals that do not hibernate, and so I set up provocations around the room to inspire the children to create stories about animals adapting in winter. This is an example of using authentic materials in an open-ended way. So this child is using air dry clay. I also use potter's clay. This year because of COVID, um, their clay is put in little bags and they each have their own bag of clay. I love these barrel beads. And they're hard to get right now because of COVID. Um, you can buy them plain and dye them if you want different colors, or you can try to purchase them um, as is. A friend of mine had one of those chair mats for her car uh, made out of barrel beads, and she took them apart and then she shared them with her story workshop friends. So I had a huge pile able, that I was able to put out for story workshop. So this child's using Y wire, barrel beads, and air dry clay to use those materials to create a story. Kinetic Sand is a great resource. So in this picture from the Opal School, the child is using materials that sort of lends itself to a theme. This might be happening at the beginning of the year where teachers want to support their learners by providing materials that they would already be familiar with. If they lived near the ocean, you would do an ocean theme. If there was a forest nearby, you would do forest themes. You might also include some retelling stories, the three bears, um, Goldilocks with Goldilocks. You might do Little Red Riding Hood, um, Three Billy Goats Gruff. So you want to initially provide familiar resources so that they can engage and start to build their oral language, um, extending it, expressive vocabulary, and so on. This might be another inquiry where we're looking at family or even the uniqueness of yourself and the child is using loose parts um, to create faces. I wanted to show you that Story Workshop can happen outdoors as well as indoors. So in this photo from my classroom, the children have created stru um, structures. And so they were. Um, this tall building actually has little rooms along the side where animals can live. And then they put the families living on top of the mountain. And in the second photo, to the right, um, they're still building enclosures, and this is in the forest, and they're using nature's loose parts to tell their story. Here's another example of indoor-outdoor. So on the left, the children are creating a story using nature loose parks and chark. And on the right-hand side, they're probably finished creating their story, and now they're engaged in talking about their story and co-writing it together. So what kind of resources will you need for Story Workshop? Nature, recycled, repurposed loose parts, peg people, fabric, mirrors, frames, art materials, paint, clay, collage, wire, light tables. I actually made my own light table with a light strip, a wooden box, and um, an offcut of plexiglass. You might use blocks. You can shop your room and look for materials that would lend themselves to story play. I love using Sharpies where children can draw their story or small bits of paper where they can glue and paste a story. 
I share resources with a colleague, and this means that I have access to additional materials. It saves me time putting together materials as well as having to store them. More recently, our early learning team acquired a grant um, from our district to purchase shared story play resources for the school. If you're part of a professional learning group in our school district, you can use those funds to purchase learning materials for your group to share or to put into your classroom. We're really excited about this grant because we're co-creating a resource. We're working together and sharing our beliefs and the ways we organize story play workshop. These shared resources are stored on a small rolling cart and we just roll them from room to room. If I'm using them Monday morning, I'll roll the cart to my room. I'll use the materials to set up invitations. The children will pack it away on the cart. We'll put it outside our door and at the end of the day, the teacher who's using it next will just roll it to their classroom. I just love the simplicity and organization of this shared resource. Here's a list of sample materials that you may want to gather. You may want some nature items, pine cones, fir cones, leaves. Um, leaves can be left fresh and they're good for a day or two. You can put them in a Ziploc bag after Story Workshop to extend. You can dip them in beeswax. This makes the color super bright and uh, makes them more of a permanent resource. You can um, press the leaves and that'll extend their life um, for and color uh, for a few weeks. You may choose to shop your recycling bin and add some milk caps, some marker caps. If you're out for dinner, you could ask the server for some of the cork from the wine bottles. Um, I have a local uh, hardware store in our community that puts off-cut keys into a little box. And so when I'm at the hardware store, he'll just pass me three or four keys to add to my collection. If you have an old necklace, you can take it apart and repurpose those beads. Screws, tiles, fabric. I love to use fabric um, in pre-COVID days. Placemats can be paper or dinner placemats or felt, felt rectangles. Scarves, necklaces. I like to take apart wreaths and I love to use mirrors in story workshop. Gems, peg persons, wooden toys, twinkle lights, mirrors, rubber animals, bugs, scrapbook paper, clay, and art materials are all purchased resources that you can use for Story Workshop. A lot of people like to use wooden stackers, rainbows, and houses. I have a little wooden bridge um, that a woodworker made for me. I love it for retelling in the fall, the three billy goats craft, but it's used all year in their stories. Something I purchased this year with my grant monies was um, artificial squares of grass. They've been probably one of the most popular materials that the children use for Story Workshop. When you're organizing materials in your classroom, you need to think about how the children will be accessing the materials, transporting the materials. Can they see the materials so they remember that it's in the classroom and available to them? Will they have continuous access? So some teachers like to um, organize the materials more theme-based in little baskets and put them on a shelf. And then they're easy for the children to um, set out on the table. I like to have my resources sorted by product type, and so we've done that together, um, the students and myself, and they're organized by color. So they're sitting on a shelf, all the pink red ones together, all the silver uh, colors together, the green colors together, the blue colors together. And this helps them to imagine, oh, I'm going to need something for the sky or something for a pond or a stream or the ocean. And they'll go and they'll gather some blue materials. You can, you will discover that children will imagine or retell a story with the loose parts. Include story play opportunities in your atelier with paints, clay, and collage materials. Depending on how much experience they've had with loose parts and story play, their stamina will grow until you cap it, until you decide this is the greatest amount of time that I can give for story workshop. For younger children, you could include 
uh, the story retelling of familiar folk tales. I always do this in the fall, so I want it to be inclusive. And I know that some of my children's expressive vocabulary in oral language won't be big enough to sustain them through more open-ended, loose parts story workshop. As a Reggio teacher, my atelier is 25 to 30 percent of my classroom. Presently, my children have access to liquid watercolor, watercolor pencils, watercolor crayons, tempera paint, clay, potter's clay and air dry clay, oil pastels, charcoal and play-doh. When I'm setting up invitations, I'll choose from my atelier and put that out. Um, during the rest of the day, when children are exploring the classroom and um, creating stories on their own, they have free access to all of the materials in the atelier. I don't put anything out that I'm not confident that they can use independently. Most recently, we added um, a salad spinner to our atelier and they've created beautiful stories um, using the salad spinner. We've also added uh, marbles and little paint jars with spoons in them so they can roll marbles on paper and create stories. This year I'm part of anointing and we're researching the connection between anxiety and process learning. We're wondering if through process learning children's uh, vo bodies will be calmer and they'll be able to concentrate more clearly and work together. Many of the teachers are using process art as the um, medium. This has funded the purchase of specific art tools that normally a school would not provide, like clay stamps, a clay cutter, sponges, and various carving tools. So as you're planning your story workshop, now you've arranged your space, you've got your materials, you've thought about what kind of invitations or provocations you're going to set out, and you need to look at your schedule. When? Will you do story workshop? How long will students be doing story workshop? How frequently will you offer this framework? If you decide to use story play or story workshop as a soft start in your morning program, you can easily set out materials before the children arrive. But if your start to the day is going really smoothly, you may decide to do it later in the day. In that case, I suggest backing it on to uh, prep or to recess. This gives you that five to ten minutes to set out invitations. If neither of those appeal to you, an alternative is to set out your invitations on cookie sheets and then when it's time to set up for story workshop, the children can just carry the cookie sheets to their workspace and begin. Either way, like any new framework, you'll need to give something up and commit to the new framework two to three times a week. Presently, I do story workshop three times a week because I work only a four-day work week, and my teacher also does story workshop on her day. So that gives the students four days of story workshop. The frequency will help you and your students become comfortable. And like any new framework, introduce your materials, practice cleanup, and have a plan for wet art. This is especially important if loose parts are new for your learners. Here's a photo from the Opal School, students during the story workshop using potter's clay. Another photo from the Opal School using Sharpies to create a story and then painting with watercolors. In the beginning, story workshop can be about 15 minutes. I find that at the beginning of the year, most students are able to work with materials and create stories for about 15 minutes. They can work side by side or together. As soon as it gets bumpy, and it will, move on to your next activity. Over time, their stamina will grow until it fits your time frame. So mine is about an hour, sometimes longer. If your students are writing, it will transition into writing workshop or they'll get their journals or clipboards and perhaps in that case you could go longer to nine minutes or two hours. So what's your role as an educator? 
Susan McKay, a teacher researcher who recently was at the Opal School, writes that adults offer provocations such as open-ended questions, intriguing dilemmas, inspiring environments, engaging materials, and loose parts for children to explore. Adults give support through observing, listening, encouraging, reflecting, and dialogue. As the educator, I like critical reflection, and this involves thinking individually and with others about fundamental beliefs and understandings, and considering how these have shaped how we view the world. So I have a critical colleague that I um, have opportunities to talk about story workshop with, and we'll reflect on how it's going, what's working really well, and we'll talk about ideas that we're trying or new directions we're taking. We'll talk about what kinds of materials we're offering the children, uh, time frames that we're currently using, and ways to engage them in story play in different frameworks that we're offering throughout the day, like exploration, or if you're doing writing workshops separately. In kindergarten, I do story dictation. So as I'm walking around with my clipboard while the children are working together, creating stories, I'll say to them, are you ready to tell me your story? And they'll say yes, or they'll say no, not yet. Sometimes they'll say, I'm ready to tell you my story. And I'll offer to record their story, um, making a small video clip, an oral recording, or I'll actually sit on a stool beside them and I'll write down their story as they tell it to me. I like to do this because then I'm able to publish their story. This demonstrates that we value their stories, that their stories can live longer than that one hour, that their time is important, and that we celebrate the work that children do together. Story dictation enables children to share their stories with family, friends, and peers. They love to do this. They're excited about their stories, and they want their story to be shared. Sometimes I'll set up um, something similar to um, the author chair um, as part of writing workshop, and I'll add that to story workshop so that when they're finished, they can tell their story to their peers. They don't have um, their story set up on the table anymore, but I can print off um, with the school printer a black and white oversized uh, photo of their story, and they can speak to that, or they can just retell it orally. You can do um, a walk, like a gallery walk, where some of the children stay at their story and others walk and they listen to them tell, share their stories. So I've done that in the past, um, later in the year. So pedagogical narration, that's the process of noticing, collecting those moments from daily practice and sharing them with colleagues children and families, and this makes their learning processes and inquiries visible to educators and open to interpretation. How do you create tabletop invitations for story play? So if you're familiar with small world play, um, tabletop invitations for story play are um, different. So they may start like small world play in the fall, as we talked about earlier, but eventually you do want to move towards more open-ended, loose parts. I like to use small containers that the children can manage. So I've collected small berry containers. Um, so just the little ones that blueberries and raspberries come in. They're small, not too many pieces. They're transparent and easy for the children to transport. If they're shopping and they need a few, and your um, storage area isn't close to where the children are working, you can provide them with small cookie sheets and they can um, shop your loose parts, put the little bins on the cookie sheets and carry them to their workspace. So here's some suggestions for setting up invitations. Small quantities arranged simply yet beautifully. Create little islands of color. Frame each child's workspace with placemats or colored paper. Allow for open-ended play with the use of loose parts. Place the invitations around the room, on tables, on the floor. Uh, because I use benches and stools, I actually put a bench in the middle of our big gathering space with a stool 
adjacent to it. And I'll set up my inspiration on the bench. Push tables together to create larger workspaces, especially for art materials. Here's a few ideas to nurture your learners. Provide plenty of play throughout your day. Introduce partner talk and think pair share, shared conversations. This gives the children regular opportunities to learn to speak to each other and to listen to each other. You can talk about body language. Storytelling with loose parts. If you begin to model telling stories with loose parts, then they, they have something to build upon if they haven't used loose parts before. We want to move them towards mature play where they're able to say, this pine cone is a tree, this cork is a person, these marker caps are a forest. Story sharing in small groups where the children share their stories, such as Vivian Pally's research on storytelling with children, is a wonderful way for them to get comfortable in talking and sharing their ideas. Multiple opportunities for children to have conversations throughout their day. So when they're having snack, introduce table talk. Set the guidelines and practice with them. When they're having lunch, continue with table talk. In the morning, you can do shared conversations where you provide a small question like, what does your family like to do on, in winter? And that gives each child an opportunity to share their thinking. Instead of having them put their hands up, teach them to look for an opening in the conversation and where they can share their idea. This encourages them to listen to each other. Looking for some more resources, suggestions, and information, I've put together some links for you. The Opal School, if you have some Pro-D money, I recommend using it to become a member or um, to do their workshops. They have really great workshops on story workshop, story play, setting the table, using different materials. The Beautiful Stuff program is something I do about every three years. I send a letter home to my families, letting them know that we're looking for to refresh our loose parts collection. I include a brown paper bag, and when the bags come back, we sort them together and we decide where the loose parts are going to go. Are they going to go to our collage art? Are they going into counting collections? Or are we going to use them for a story workshop? School District 38 has a large Reggio-inspired group of teachers, and they've spent a lot of time on Story Workshop. They visited the Opal School, they work with the Opal School, and they've brought Opal School presenters to their school district. Those teachers are so generous with their time. They've created videos to share with um, teachers new to Story Workshop, and so I highly recommend visiting this, their site. Caldwell Collective emerged out of the Opal School. It's a research hub, and they have a lot of um, early learning research to share with educators, including Story Workshop. Nature Play on Vancouver Island is my blog, and because um, play, based learning, and story play and story workshop are frameworks that I use in my program. I tend to write about them and share what's happening in my program. So I recommend that you visit my blog as well. What types of assessment tools complement story workshop? Uh, we've talked about video clips and photos. And so sometimes what I'll do is I'll take photos for me. I want to notice um, who's working with who. I want to see how complex their stories have become. I'm interested in the resources they're using. And so I might take some photos. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then after school, when I'm going through my assessment, I'll look through the photos and then I'll delete them. Anecdotal notes. So I may make some notes on um, what specific specific children I'm interested in knowing more about and understanding what they um, need to learn next, maybe some next steps, or what they're doing really well. I'll do observations. I'm observing, are they settling into a story workshop? Um, is it taking them a long time to, to make decisions? Um, are they c uh, communicating clearly with each other? Are they asking good questions? I um, 
use exemplars. So um, later in the year when the students start to take their clipboards and draw their story or write their story, I have those exemplars to assess at the end of the day. I can send them home to parents. I can upload them to their ePortfolios. I have the stories that they dictated and that we've added to our story workshop um, celebration wall or that I've added to their ePortfolio. Thanks for joining my session today. Like the Opal School, I want you to be able to revisit today's session as often as you want in the hope that it will inspire and support you. I'll upload it to my YouTube channel, Reggio Kinders, for the next three months. I also wanted to mention that this year I started an Instagram account, Reggio Kinders, <coughs> pardon me, and I find that excellent resource for professional development. I can add like-minded Reggio educators to my Instagram account, including the Opal School, and I get to see how they set up their frameworks. Uh, for example, Story Workshop. So lots of information there, and I highly recommend um, is setting up an Instagram account and then following um, educators who uh, work aligns with what you're interested in knowing more about. I also want to thank the Opal School for being such an inspiration to Reggio-inspired educators. My spring trip to their school was cancelled due to COVID, but I look forward to a time when travel is safe again. Thank you for your time, and I hope that today's workshop will support your entry into Story Workshop.